Hey, all you history buffs out there. It's Johnny and I've got Connor with me today. And we are going to be reacting to Mr. Beat's video, The 10 Worst Presidents of All Time. Here is my video counting down the 10 worst presidents in American history. Okay, number 10, Benjamin Harrison. Okay. <laughs> That's a pretty good choice for a, a lower-tier yeah. president. Benjamin Harrison. Okay, he was all about really high tariffs, and you all know how I feel about tariffs, right? No. <laughs> I don't watch enough Mr. Beat. Uh, but I feel like tariffs are, an, are a tool in the toolkit of the president. So whether the president raises them or lowers them, it just depends on the economic situation at the time and whether that's a good idea or not. It's a necessary, normal thing that yeah. president too all right right i'm not a very big fan of tariffs bad job benjamin harrison was supportive <laughs> of the okay. overthrow of queen leo Quilani and the taking of hawaii which is one of the shadiest parts of american history mm. uh i mean benjamin harrison did submit a treaty to the senate uh for the annexation of hawaii mm. but i actually read this piece not too long ago by George W. Baker, uh, about Benjamin Harrison in Hawaii. And according to him, uh, Benjamin Harrison was not that keen on annexing Hawaii and was actually one of the people in the Harrison administration who was trying to slow down the impulse to mm. just grab Hawaii. Uh, and that he, his secretary of state, James Blaine, was really the jingo of the group. You know about jingoism? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like that hardcore Teddy Roosevelt style nationalism and imperialism. Uh, Harrison was apparently not very suspicious of those types of people. So he was actually trying to rein it in. I feel um, like it's dangerous to just say that this happened under the president's watch. So it's his fault. Like, uh, just like when people talk about like the stock market under the president, like as if they had the biggest influence and they're able to do all this stuff, like diving into how that uh, happened in Hawaii, I feel like would be a little bit better than just being like, they took Hawaii under him. Also, the Wounded Knee Massacre occurred yeah. under his watch. Okay, not only did Harrison approve, but the army gave out medals of honor like they were candy afterward. But I could tell you stuff about Ulysses Grant that's that bad. I could tell you stuff about Rutherford B. Hayes that's that bad. I don't know if they gave awards to people who, I mean, I'm sure they gave awards to people who participated in massacres, but I mean, they were giving medals of honor out uh, a lot in the post-Civil War period. This is when the Medal of Honor actually emerges. And most of the fighting was going on out West against Native groups. And so most people were winning their medals of honors for uh, engagements with the Apache, the yeah. Comanche, uh, wounded knee, of course, is like one of the great shames of the American government and military. Uh, and the fact that Harrison papers over it by giving out these awards is definitely shameful, but I don't think that makes him uniquely bad compared to other presidents of his time. Exactly. For a massacre, number nine, Andrew Johnson. Now, I Oh, come on. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> wasn't going to put him on this list. I feel like a lot of historians talk boring. a lot of trash about him unfairly, but you know, I'm he's tr he's right that they do talk a lot of trash about him unfairly, but they talk about some trash fairly too with Johnson. I'm all about character, right? And this guy was driven by his ego. This guy cared first and foremost only about his own legacy and his oh, own come desires. On. He refused what president doesn't. You're telling me that Teddy Roosevelt wasn't all about himself? Tell me Woodrow Wilson wasn't all about himself. Donkey Trump, come on. The Bush family, I could go on. Well, I also think that Mr. B is doing something that I've often warned against on this channel, which is participating in the ephemeral political debates of the age as though they're history. A lot of the stuff on Andrew Johnson being an egomaniac it comes from the hyper partisan charged up newspapers of the time that were going out of their way 
to write the most outrageous and salacious things about President Johnson. He used to compromise, and he seemed to dig in his heels when he faced opposition. Speaking of opposition, just as blatant opposition to civil rights for African Americans, as seen with his fighting the 14th and 15th Amendments and Civil Rights yeah. Act, I mean, that ended up... Yeah, I mean, the 14th Amendment guarantees equal protections of the law regardless of race. It's also the most far-reaching amendment in the Constitution. So I can imagine that a lot of people who lived in that time were concerned about a, an amendment that would fundamentally transform the Constitution and the federal government from a hands-off institution to one that actually goes into your state and forces you your laws to conform to federal standards. Because the 14th Amendment you know, says that Congress will pass legislation to enforce this amendment. The original the amendments before 14 weren't like that. They were like, you have the right to worship without the government interfering. You have the right to own a gun and a well-regulated militia without the, uni the uh, Congress making a law against that. Congress shall make no law against free speech. It was like protections of your rights. And the 14th Amendment uh, is a protection of rights for African-Americans, uh, but it's also giving the federal government more powers than the Constitution originally gave. Because a lot of the things that the radical Republicans wanted to do, they are very aspirational and anti-racist in character, but they required the United States military to occupy the Southern states. And so you might want to ask yourself, like, would you have wanted the mm -hmm. American military to be implanted in a whole section of the country, potentially indefinitely, with no one in the government to like serve as oversight to make sure they weren't abusing their powers. Johnson saw himself as sort of the last stopgap between the excesses of the radical Republicans. <laughs> They're holding back African-Americans for generations. This makes him look exceptionally bad. And he was a white supremacist, but mostly though his stubbornness <laughs> in politics. I mean, I know the radical Republicans that and he, he opposed were also stubborn, but his refusal to compromise with them just made it look like he only cared about his own selfish desires and didn't care about the greater good of the country. Can number eight. All right. This, that's a good, that's a good number eight. Yeah. It's George W. Bush. Okay. Obviously, I'm even more biased living through the presidency of George W. Bush, but I disagreed with his response to the 9-11 attacks in several ways. The AUMF, or the Authorization to Use Military Force Man. Against Terrorists, yeah. basically give a blank check for the president to fight terrorism around the world. It's still... Yeah. I mean, it takes, it takes a Congress and a Senate to pass it. And some pictures of right. GWB at ground zero, like shaking hands with firemen. Yeah. It took to Joe Biden. It. I think even Bernie Sanders voted for this. So uh, Bernard? It, yeah. Oh, goodness. It's like, yeah, I know that um, Bush immediately came out and was like, the terrorists did this and we'll make them pay. We're going to smoke them out of their caves. But he was voicing what 99% of people and almost all the politicians were saying, like even Bernie Sanders was supporting the Bush administration at this point in time. So to, to put it, push it all on Bush again, I think is a little bit, it, it sort of absolves other people of responsibility. Like let's say Senator Joe Biden, for example, still in effect, the Patriot act, which really was one of Garbage. the worst <laughs> laws ever passed in American history yeah. really just stripped many civil liberties that Americans used to take for granted. It's so the funny that Republicans are always the people like they're taking our rights away. And then you look at re what Republican presidents do and you're like, but that was your man. He did that. The Iraq war dragging out the Afghanistan war with, with no end in sight. Not a fan of all these things. His response to Hurricane Katrina. The Great Recession happened under his watch and he responded. Yeah, he blew Katrina, but a lot of that was PR stuff too, right? Like he said, heck of a job, Brownie, to the to the guy on the site. He was, he was photographed looking out the window of Air Force One as he flew over the wreckage, which was like, that was definitely an unfair criticism of him that he they were like, look at Bush, he's looking out the window while these people suffer. Bush didn't want to land in New Orleans because he didn't want to like cause a scene. So a lot of that stuff is kind of based on like, in retrospect, they're like, no, the, the U.S. government just is terrible. And I can tell you, if you think George Bush is bad for his response to Katrina, what about Calvin Coolidge and his response to um, the, the Great Bowl? Flood of Louisiana? You know, I What mean, was the Dust Bowl? Who, who did the Dust Bowl? Hoover, I think. Oh, well, he's garbage, too. 
But like they didn't like Hoover better be on this list. Coolidge, they were begging Coolidge for months to send money, and he was like, "No, I refuse." George Bush has never been the type of president who's like, "No, I'm not sending money." He's not that kind of a conservative. He's, in fact, George W. Bush is the reason that we have so many bailouts now. I mean, he was the first president to like pass major bailout legislation after a re economic recession. And then Obama followed suit completely. Since Bush, every single president has passed a gigantic bailout. Every single one. Think about it, right? Bush, Obama in his first months in office. Trump in his last months in office passed major uh, in 2020 during the pandemic. And Biden started his administration with a bailout. Responded to it with crony capitalism, which I'm not a big fan of. Bailing out banks and corporations, et cetera. Mm. No child left behind. No teacher I know actually is a fan of No Child Left Behind. I know a teacher who hates Le No Child Left Behind too. So I'd say my I've heard it was bad, myself. but I've heard that everything that's replaced it is bad. I just they, we don't know what we're doing with education. Yeah, it was like a major bipartisan achievement when he passed that bill too. He passed it with Ted Kennedy, and yeah. you know. Ted? Not a good law. He expanded the surveillance state. The Department of Homeland Security, yeah, we the TSA, that, all. Though. He already yeah, said I mean, that. You know Obama that. All that. Detaining too. suspects without warrants who were never charged with any crime, never given any due process. Don't get me wrong. All that stuff is terrible. It's some of the worst, darkest recesses of the presidency is George Bush. But yeah, other presidents did that too. Just show that he often made decisions out of fear, not out of reason. But such a nice guy, though. I love you, W. Sorry about this. The for watching. Number seven, okay. Woodrow Wilson. What? First of all, Cypher from the cynical historian has definitely influenced my perception of Woodrow Wilson. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, no. This guy, he makes this video where he's just like, here's why everything, like when Woodrow Wilson breathed, everything went wrong. Wilson! Wait, before you scroll away. <laughs> Democratic headquarters urgently needs you to sign. What's up? To protect hey, he voted for the, the deadline uh, authorization Republicans to use are force. Trying to it's Chuck E. Cheese. He right voted for the war in Iraq. I think he voted for the war in Iraq. It's surprising to see Republicans. Wilson was all about spreading democracy around the world, a very egocentric foreign policy. Mm -hmm. That's not true, actually. Wilson came to be associated with that because during the First World War, uh, his most famous speech, the world must be made safe for democracy. Uh, but Woodrow Wilson was actually not that, actually a big critic of democracy. Uh, he was really more of a Hamiltonian uh, in his- Yeah, but Hamilton's, I hate Hamilton. But Hamilton didn't believe in de democracy as much as others like Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and Woodrow Wilson thought that uh, he actually hated the entire American system of government. He wanted it to be like a British style par parliamentary system. Um, but this notion that Woodrow Wilson was like a crusader for democracy uh, is only it only comes into play during World War One, which was one of the most unprecedented historical events in history and put the United States in an incredible position. Woodrow Wilson used the rhetoric of the high ideals of democracy to promote the cause of the United States in that fight. But in most of his career, uh, Wilson was actually a little bit more of an isolationist than you, you might not uh, realize. When he was elected to the presidency, he said, it would be a supreme irony of fate if my administration was to deal with foreign affairs. Sure, it said, hey, self-determination, right? But it assumed that Americans knew what was best for the entire world, and thus yeah. Wilson paved the way for future American interventionism. One yeah. big reason why he got elected in 1916 was because... No, I mean, McKinley... Uh, but Wilson takes interventionism to a whole new level. I would agree with that. Because he said he kept the country out of World War I. What happens after he gets re-elected? He gets the country involved in World War I. Asking... Yeah, that's another myth, um, you know, the, or it's not a myth, but it's like a common trope is like, Wilson said he ran on, Wilson ran on, he kept us out of war. Read my lips, did. no World War One. Yeah. But hey, if in 1912, the American public had decided to elect Teddy Roosevelt over Woodrow Wilson, we would not have been kept out of war for three years. We would have been there in 1914 and we would have been 
just another country getting our asses kicked by the war machine. Uh, Wilson kept us out of war for three years and he probably saved millions of American lives Mm. by doing that. Now he didn't save millions of European lives, but he's the president of the United States and we're, we're grading him on how well he does the job of president. If you save millions of lives by keeping them out of a terrible war and then go in and only lose a hundred thousand soldiers and win the war and you get to dictate the terms of peace it's pretty strategically brilliant what he actually pulls off but um they just like to make the joke he also kept us he did keep us out of war not he didn't keep us out of world war one but he kept us out of war with mexico which was actually what people were thinking about more when they heard the slogan he kept us out of war they weren't thinking about world war one so much they were thinking about uh there was a revolution going on in mexico and some of it was spilling over the border into the united states uh mexico had good relations with germany and so they were plotting to do stuff to the united states and launch attacks and wilson kept us from going in and actually fighting a war against mexico in Congress to declare war, and they do. And during the war, the Espionage Act, the Sedition Act, two of the worst laws in American history, urinating on the first... Yeah, they're terrible laws, I agree. First Amendment. <laughs> and Cypher pointed this out in one of his videos. I never knew this, but apparently he wanted the Sedition Act before the United States even entered World War One. And Of course he did. They were already being attacked by Germans before the war even started. It's not like the United States was sitting off in the corner by itself safe. And Wilson just decided like out of the blue to take us into the war. There was the largest explosion in the history of the country it took place in a port city off of New Jersey where Germans had actually blown up like a large warehouse of American stockpiles and weapons and ships. So there was a threat like Germany was attacking us. It's not like we were just sitting off in our little corner and then Wilson was like, you know, it would be good if we got in the war after I told people we didn't have to go to the war, you know. Most of our presidents were racist, okay? We've got to consider historical relativism, but Wilson was exceptionally racist <laughs> even for his time. He was exceptionally racist even for his time? Mm, I don't think so. I think he was, he was normal racist for his time. Just he as was, racist. He was maybe normal racist for a Southerner of mm. his time, for a white Southerner. He was probably less racist than a lot of people, uh, but he was still very racist. He was probably equally racist as uh, Theodore Roosevelt. He was pretty damn racist towards specifically black people, I will say that. Uh, but he wasn't anti-Semitic. He, <laughs> he appointed the first Jewish uh, Supreme Court justice of the state of new jersey and the first jewish supreme court justice in the united states so uh didn't have a problem with the jews so much but other races so i mean yes that is racism right if you yeah rank races you know the screening of the birth of a nation at the white house and then calling it historically accurate not a very smart move by wilson ignoring this that's, that's yeah. pretty crazy i mean I'm not going to excuse that, but he went to school with the guy who wrote the screenplay. Oh, the movie was put in front of him and played for him. And he watched it. Um, things were constantly put in front of Woodrow Wilson. They were like, here, look at this here. Look at that. So he was just doing his busy schedule. And then they were like, watch this movie. It'll blow your mind. He sat down the first hour and a half of a birth of a nation actually takes place. It's the story of Abraham Lincoln. So it's not obvious it's going in the Ku Klux Klan direction, I think, until the second half of the movie. Um, but it was uh, one of the foundational pieces of cinema uh, in American history. In fact, there's a great documentary where Spike Lee talks about how when he was in film school, he studied A Birth of a Nation uh, for its, you know, epic portrayals, its cinematography, uh, it had achieved something that film had not yet achieved in terms of its scope. In fact, that's one of the things that's most kind of creepy about it is that it's this hugely, horribly racist film glorifying, you know, racist terrorism. Uh, and yet it's a foundational piece of cinema. Wilson, ignoring all the lynchings that were going on across the country when he was president, he ignored a lot of things. 
you got to realize that this is the time period too when like civil rights is starting to really grow in the United States and groups like the NAACP are starting to come into existence. And so there were protesters at the D.W. Griffith movie at the birth of a nation. There were protesters there saying like this theater should be shut down for showing this movie. So it wasn't like, oh, back in the old days when like everyone was just racist. It wasn't like that. There was strong movements to fight for racial justice. And Mr. Beat is right. Woodrow Wilson was not you know, part of that. He did not uh, get on that train and he didn't speak out against the lynchings that were going on in the country, which were rampant during his presidency. Things apparently ignoring women's rights. You know, he, they were marching across the country for the right to vote. He ignored them. He, That's true. He, he supported the amendment, the 19th Amendment. He endorsed it. It took him a while, but he did endorse it. He ignored the first Red Scare going on. A lot of chaos around. He did not ignore the first Red Scare. He was the fucking source of the Red Scare. <laughs> he was the creator of the Red Scare. His government, uh, his Department of Justice had mm. lists of people drawn up of radicals to go arrest around the country. That's what caused the Red Scare. Number six, William McKinley. This one may surprise many of you because McKinley is consistently ranked in the top half of presidents, usually because the economy was good when he was president and the U.S. was becoming a world superpower due to a more aggressive foreign policy. Well, guess what? This foreign policy sucked. McKinley's foreign <laughs> policy was based on a Christian slash American exceptionalism mentality that meant the U.S. was going to be spreading its influence around the world in places it shouldn't be. Okay. Again, that's the same problem with Wilson. He's right. McKinley definitely believed in manifest destiny. He believed in a Christian American policy, as did, you know, Abraham Lincoln believed that too. Uh, but as president, he was like Benjamin Harrison, who was trying to stop the Hawaii people from getting control and just like Woodrow Wilson who was trying to stop the pro World War I people from getting control McKinley was trying to stop the jingos from taking control of foreign policy when uh, the lead up to the Spanish War was taking place McKinley was doing everything he could to negotiate with the Spanish Empire it, not just to avoid a war in Cuba with Spain but also to help Spain save face <laughs> like he was trying to help them like there was a rebellion going on in Cuba against the Spanish Empire a local rebellion that many Americans were funding and helping out in and mercenaries were going in and joining the rebellion and McKinley was trying to help Spain sort of give Cuba its autonomy while also saving face because in Spain at the time you had extremely patriotic right-wing fascists basically like pro early versions of fascists in the government who are like let's make spain great let's go crush these rebellions and like reassert the spanish empire at a time when the spanish empire was the sick man of the world uh and the american empire was on the ascendancy so william mckinley was actually a restraining force even even when the main when that fucking ship got blown up the main and everybody in the newspapers was writing like it's nine they were it was basically like 9 11 imagine if after 9 11 george bush came out and was like we don't know who did this we're not gonna, not going to draw any conclusions it's possible that these planes accidentally flew into the twin towers we're going to wait and see that's what mckinley said after the main blew up he was like we don't know if the spanish did it we're going to wait and see we're going to wait for the evidence to come in and he postponed the war by like a month. Uh, well, that's pretty cool. People were like red in the face. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, his Navy secretary, called said he had the backbone of a chocolate eclair. <sighs> so this idea that he came into office specifically to spread American democracy around the world, not any more than any other president. The Spanish-American War, a war built on lies. McKinley, you know, he struggled with the decision at first, but after talking to God, God said, yes, you should go to war with Spain. And so it's another one of those, like, that's what people said about McKinley, and therefore I'm going to just pretend like that's the truth. It sounds fun, though. Yeah, no. He's on a mission from God.
he prayed to God for everything and every decision he made. He didn't pray to God. He didn't just like, they weren't just like, Mrs. McKinley, should we go to war with Spain? And he was like, hmm, war with Spain. God, any thoughts? And God was like, yes. And he was like, okay, God says yes, let's go. No, once he was convinced that war was probably the way that this was going, he pr he he went home and he prayed to God. And that's his right. You know, he wasn't shaking a magic eight ball is what I'm saying. Like, that's mm -hmm. yeah. So he went to Congress after that, and they declared war on Spain. The Philippine-American War that happened as a continuation e of the Spanish-American War, one. that doesn't get much attention it's because it makes one. the United States look pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah, but McKinley does. justified that wars. war, a war in which Americans killed civilians and rounded them up and put them into concentration camps. McKinley justified this because he thought the Filipinos were incapable of self-governing. He was the first by... Yeah, so did Teddy Roosevelt, so did William Howard Taft, who became the governor of the Philippines. Dude, and Theodore Roosevelt was president throughout most of the Philippine War. So a lot of those atrocities were not actually happening under McKinley's watch. But McKinley was the one who said, yep, let's go uh, attack the Philippines. And hey, let's even start fighting in China. So it's true. Like once McKinley bit the imperialism bullet, he, he devoted himself to it Dude. for sure bypass Congress to send troops to fight in China during the Boxer Rebellion. As I said earlier, yes, the economy was doing well under McKinley's watch, but he had high tariffs. And again, I am not a fan of high tariffs. But mostly I'm a critic of McKinley due to his brash imperialism and his general disregard for the sovereignty of nations that just wanted to be left alone. Number five. How dare he put my boy Dickie Nix <laughs> on the 10 worst presidents? He's a shitty you. guy. I don't <laughs> know if he's a shitty president. You love Nixon, don't you? He got the he's got the Marine Wildlife Act and the like Forest Creatures Act. And he's he's interesting. He's That's really true. interesting. Let's see what Mr. B thinks. Richard Nixon. He was a pathological liar who mostly yes. just cared about himself and his own legacy. Now, I know there are a lot of obvious reasons to hate on Nixon. He was a crook. I mean, <laughs> Watergate. His paranoia and backstabbing make it seem obvious why he's on this list and most people's lists. However, the war on drugs is probably the okay. biggest mistake that's of Nixon. Fair. Nixon that's started fair. the war on drugs, yeah. and we are still yeah, seeing do. the horrible effects of it. So that's why that he's a bad guy. You know, he's, Nixon. <laughs> he's, Nixon. <a> shit. <laughs> he's yeah. not. He's not a. He's not number five on worst presidents. Maybe he's like number ten. Yeah. Nixon got elected, promising to end the Vietnam War. But the war just dragged on during but his he, presidency. He, he Meanwhile, couldn't, he couldn't stop it. He wanted to stop it. But he couldn't stop it. Well, I don't know. They were they were talking about making peace in 1968. And Nixon went over there and was like, don't make peace until I get elected president. I'll get you a better deal. And so he was actually like conducting foreign policy with Vietnam for his own electoral success. Uh, and like that's why he's great. Chances. That's yeah. why he's good at being president. While secretly dropping bombs and cancer causing chemicals on civilians in both yeah, Vietnam yeah, and yeah. Cambodia, yeah. he implemented wage and price controls, and this was horrible for the economy. A big reason why the horrible stagflation of the 70s occurred was because of his administration. Now, don't get me wrong, Nixon did a lot of good and was highly intelligent, opening up relations with China, his policy of detente with the Soviet Union, yeah, and the, the creation right of the EPA. <laughs> are I mean, he did Those do like a million things. great things. Yeah. Those are amazing things. I know. The EPA is a big deal. I'm surprised Benjamin Harrison's on this list too, because Benjamin Harrison created Yosemite National Park. He was the first conservationist. And oh. then he says, EPA, he's like, he likes the EPA with Nixon, but he gave Benjamin Harrison a bad review. Kind of surprised. Um, but Probably anyway. my favorite three accomplishments of Nixon, but he had such poor character. Come on, and the boogers sticking out. That's in his Hi, YouTube video. Yeah, I don't like that part. Residents? I know this is hard to boogers? hear, but it's. 
Well, we don't need to watch the rest of this. We can maybe cut Number that. four, Herbert uh, yeah. Hoover. Herbert He's Hoover, garbage. of course, makes me list because <laughs> of the Great Depression. It's actually a myth that Herbert Hoover did nothing in response to the early stages in what would become known as the Great Depression. The Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act, for example, in 1929, raising in yeah. Who is taxes. that guy, third from the right? This guy? One more to the left. This guy? Who is that? I think it's Stanley Tucci's grandfather. <laughs> Increasing income taxes Dude to balance to the budget. Ahead. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation to bail out businesses. And increased crony capitalism likely just made things worse. Under his watch, a recession became the Great Depression. His treatment of the... Yeah, I mean, and it, and it dragged on under yeah. FDR for eight years. And then somehow after eight years of FDR not fixing the economy, he was like, I think I should get a third term. <laughs> uh, but one, I think one difference between Hoover and Roosevelt is that Hoover actually used the, the federal government to employ people, which was like the conservatives biggest nightmare. They were like, if the United States government is going to be responsible for getting people employed that is way too much responsibility on a federal government right mm. and i i agree because a lot of the jobs that fdr created were completely pointless and useless are um, you telling me that fdr isn't the best president that we've ever had i mean you could argue that fdr uh prolonged the depression and and then like also like subverted democracy by running for four terms, including the fourth one when he was on death's door <laughs> and like he should not have run for that term at all. Uh, but because FDR is the World War II president, it's hard to throw him on, under the bus like so easily, I feel, uh, because he does lead the United States through World War II. The World War I bonus yeah. army veterans in D.C. was disgraceful. Yeah, Simply put, yeah. he like sent the troops to kill them. Hoover did try to end the Great Depression but simply made it worse. FDR didn't have much success either after that, but at least FDR seemed to be more in touch with ordinary people. Hoover seemed very out of touch with most Americans. But it's true that like FDR's ability to mesmerize the people by, with his rhetoric, you know, it, it definitely was more than Hoover offered. Number three, Franklin Pierce. This should be your worst oh, president. Pierce, where this is the I hottest begin? president. What are you talking know. about here? There's the, I looked up, so for every one of these presidents, I looked up an article that just put, I put the president's name and put was good and nothing. Franklin Pierce, not a single article could I find. He's hot. Defending him. He's he was, the hot president. He is the worst president. <laughs> Period. I can't think I, of a single thing about him. I like honestly. I got to I got to tell you, I can't think of a single thing about him. I don't. I don't even oh, know well. what he did. He was just like super pro slavery. Oh, no, how about oh, with shit. the Kansas Nebraska Act? Again, a not lot. personally pro slavery, but he was just like pro. He's his his entire political career was to serve the slave power. What number are we at right now? I think three. Okay. That was one of the worst laws passed in American history, and he signed it in the law. A doe face. I agree with that. Sorry, that was a little harsh there, but you know, a northerner who was perfectly fine with slavery. The Austin Manifesto. Wait, who, who are Pierce faces? seemed to be. The politicians before Lincoln all were clean shaven, uh, and a lot of the more aristocratic ones were clean shaven, and they were tended to be sort of like supportive of of the south and so like pierce clean shaven buchanan clean shaven they were called doe faces um mm. yeah okay with declaring war on spain if it refused to sell cuba to the united states yeah like compared to mckinley this guy was a super expansionist who thought like we should spend all of our time just conquering and taking over places he didn't he wanted to take cuba he recognized a rogue american government that had conquered nicaragua at one point that like reintroduced slavery to central america like geez he was the george w bush of his time and guess who yeah, is worry. his direct descendant Paul Pierce. Barbara Pierce Bush. Oh, shit. Yeah. So there's a little bit of that Bush. And they say that Bush Jr. 
is very much like his mother. So he's really more Pierce than Bush because Bush Sr. was a lot more restrained with military uh, projection. Hmm. But this guy was always trying to project American power. At a time when the country was so divided, it was about to fall apart. The Civil War was on the horizon and he's trying to get this country to be like doing imperialism. It was just a bad combination. But not only that, he was probably drunk for a lot of his presidency. All right. All right, Pierce first. wanted Cuba annexed as a slave state. Boy, did that make Northerners happy. At a rocky time when the country needed unity, Pierce arguably helped further divide the country. Also, at a time when the country needed a more hands-on and active president, he was not. But you know who was worse? Number two, James Buchanan. That's right, Buchanan. I disagree with this one being worse than Pierce. Because I think that James Buchanan, a lot of his administration was bad, but there were some upsides. I can't even think of, I can't even find, so far I haven't been able to find any upsides. Like um, Buchanan had good relations with Great Britain, for example. He smoothed over a couple of close ones with, with Great Britain. So, yeah. I mean, you can give him that. Uh, but yeah, most of what he did was bad too. Before, Both before Pierce and Buchanan play. are the worst. For he took over as president after Pierce, and instead of learning from Pierce's mistakes, he just let the country become even more divided. Another face. You didn't have to bleep that out. I said face. Okay, doe face. He was a president who did nothing. He didn't want to make anyone mad, but he also didn't want to make anyone happy. He was personally against slavery. He said it was morally wrong and yet proceeded to speak out in favor for the Dred Scott decision, one of the Shit. worst Supreme Court decisions yeah. in American history. He didn't just speak out in favor of it. His inaugural address was days before the decision came down and he had actually talked to the Chief Justice and he likely knew what the decision was going to be. So in his inaugural address, he's like, whatever the court decides, I believe that we as Americans should all follow it. And I believe that this decision that's coming down will forever settle the question of slavery in this country. <laughs> and it didn't. How could you describe yourself as anti-slavery, but be like, Dred Scott, we got it. We nailed it on that one. Because if you were if you had to share a country with a bunch of people who did something that you were against, but you also knew that they had lots of guns and if you fucked with them too hard on it, they might form an army and like secede and kill you. You might be a coward and just do whatever they want, even though you're personally disgusted by their habits. Right? Some may. <laughs> I, I myself find find to be more cavalier. Yeah. With what I say and what I do with my time. Yeah. I think it's helpful to know that this guy was in politics longer than any other person who had ever been president. And he was the most experienced politician ever to be president before Joe Biden. So I think like slavery was just a, one in a long string of like moral causes that Buchanan was just sort of like numb to after a while as just like a career politician. Hmm. He didn't have the heart to like fight against slavery. He He might have thought personally it was bad, but... He was a cynical, like, lifetime politician. Hmm. But he basically just let the South do whatever they wanted. When the states seceded after the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860, he blamed the Northerners and the abolitionists. Ah. By the time he was out of... <laughs> Wait, pretty... but that's... Blame Certainly. is a weird word. But the Northerners are the reason why the war happened. In that, they're like, stop doing this. And then the South <laughs> And then they're like, we're coming down there. And the South is like, try it. And then we did. And then we fucking creamed them. Number one, we didn't cream them. The war was four years long and they kicked our butts throughout most of it. Uh, it wasn't until people like Ulysses Grant actually got to take charge of the army that's, that we started to crush this. And then we wrecked them. But the end when they but, had no supplies. Yeah. They, had very they were few like, left. yeah, no shoes. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, but I think that, I mean, John Brown was a Northerner and a Yankee and an abolitionist. And he was a big reason there was a civil war because his attack uh, in, in West Virginia at Harper's Ferry and then him getting arrested and put on trial and hanged and how people argued about it. It was, it was sort of like the Kyle, whatever, Rittenhouse, Rittenhouse case. It was kind of like the Kyle Rittenhouse case because like half the people were like, you know, 
he was justified in fighting against slavery by any means necessary. And half the people were like, no, in a law and order society, if you go and do this, you should be subject to the law. And so it was one of these. Kyle Rittenhouse was influenced by violent video games. <laughs> this this wouldn't have happened if GTA and Call of Duty didn't exist. Well, John Brown was influenced by dramatic depictions of violence from a book called The Bible. So maybe we need to get these kids off the Bible. Get it out of here. Let's burn <laughs> the Bible. <laughs> um, but certainly I wouldn't say that the South specifically caused the war or the north i would say that this fundamental disagreement that was baked into the country caused the war and it would happen because of a certain subset of historical circumstances the election of abraham lincoln at the time when it happened caused the south to react by seceding but yeah but like how could you possibly say that it's all the north's fault and believe that slavery is abhorrent like that doesn't add up at all they the the union whether it was republicans or democrats and including lincoln they were initially trying to avert the war they were trying to avert the secession crisis they were trying to save the union with slavery so like lincoln was against slavery but when he came into office if he was able to succeed in preventing the southern states from leaving without war and with slavery, he would have done that too. I so don't think the people it wasn't until, yeah. could do that though. I think yeah. after a while the people were just fucking finished with slavery, like stop for the love of God. Well, be, because once the war officially kicked off, yeah. number one, the soldiers were going into the South and seeing, physically seeing slavery for many of them the first times in their lives. But and second of all, the slaves themselves upon word that the Yankee army was coming began yeah. to escape the farms and plantations and insist that they be freed. Warren Harding. He once Warren said, folks, I am not fit for this office and should never have been here. I agree. He appointed many of his corrupt buddies to be in his cabinet. So That's Charles Evans Hughes. What are you talking about? His corrupt buddy. That's one of the most prominent and famous Statesmen of the age. Okay. Anyway. Some of them famously got in trouble for bribery in what became known as the Teapot Dome scandal. I know this. Which nobody knows how involved Warren G. Harding was in the Teapot Dome scandal. You know about the Teapot Dome scandal? I know I was supposed to. I, I remember yeah. learning about it multiple times, but. It was I just basically remember. they were trying to sell federal land to private oil barons at like bargain Jeez. prices fucking yeah. disgusting but i it wasn't ever clear that harding knew about it and it was after he died that a series of extremely salacious books were written uh to sort of tear down his legacy and so like again i think it's a little bit of, again of an exercise of like you're taking the political arguments of the past and pretending like they're historical analysis. He didn't stand for anything. You didn't know where he stood because Damn. he rarely stated where he stood on issues. He seemed to have no moral compass. While president, he would often cheat on his wife and he had parties in the White House where they would illegally gamble and smuggle in alcohol at the height of prohibition. All that stuff he just mentioned is like going on in the Kennedy White House, too. Um, sort of. Not illegally yeah. drinking. Remember, his dad was the, the illegal supplier of the <laughs> yeah. alcohol. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Illegally supplying. Okay. Yeah. He didn't ever get much work done. He preferred socializing and partying to working. When he actually did work, he signed crappy laws. One law he actually did sign was the Emergency Quota Act, which was really a law designed to favor Western and Northern European immigrants and limit immigrants from Southern yeah. and Eastern Europe, as well as most of the rest of the world. That's, that's a, that, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, he it, he was against it, but si but was pushed into signing it though. Because a lot of those, like, you know, Chester Arthur gets a lot of shit for the Chinese Exclusion Act, but he actually vetoed it. And then they pressured him and twisted his arm. It's actually the labor unions that were like, 
we don't want Chinese immigrants driving down our wages. And so they prevented Chinese immigrants from coming in. But like the history of preventing non-European immigrants, ha that's a long history. To sum it up, while Harding was a nice guy who was easy to get along with, he surrounded himself with shady characters and avoided Sweet any shit. action whatsoever. Two things I want to say about Warren Harding. Number one, uh, if you hate the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act so much, if you hated the destruction of civil liberties under President Wilson, Warren Harding should be one of your favorite presidents because he reversed a lot of the policies that Woodrow Wilson uh, had enacted during the First World War. He released scores of political prisoners from jail, gave them pardons, including Eugene Debs, who had been put in jail for speaking out against the war. Warren Harding wrote him a pardon, set him free. Uh, so Warren Harding's entire slogan, return to normalcy, it was about like, let's stop being at each other's throats and suspecting each other as spies and in collaboration with the Germans or whatever the case may be. Let's be Americans again. Let's get along. Let's relax. And let's stop persecuting each other and putting people putting our prominent statesmen in jail just for disagreeing with administration policy. So free speech really, you know, takes a great leap forward from Wilson's administration, thanks to this guy. Hmm. He de-escalates so much of what Wilson was doing. Uh, and the other reason why he's, he's a good president is that during his administration, at the height of the lynchings and the racist mobs, Tulsa happened when he was president. He goes to Alabama and he gives this great speech about civil rights and why the only way America can truly live up to its promise is if all people are treated equally. Mm. And so he was very strongly pro civil rights. Well, that will do it. Those are my 10 least favorite presidents. All right. Well, that does it. There, there we have it. There's the 10 worst presidents. Everything's shit. COVID.